Welcome to our panel, which is the first panel of a series of panels called Civil Society Sharing Screen. This is a series of panels carried out with the support of the European Union. And our aim is to make sure that we have local and international civil society professionals, academics, experts, and human rights activists coming together to talk about uh, the main approaches in civil society. You can learn more about the dates of the upcoming panels through the website of the Foundation. This is going to be a long series of panels and we're going to continue organizing our panels in the future. So please, please stay tuned. So this will be the inauguration activity of our series of panels and we have Samuel Mon from Yale University to talk about is the human rights movement in crisis and we will also have Nilgün Arisan with us uh, from TEPAV Economic Policy and Research Foundation of Turkey she's the director of EU Institute so before I give the floor to Ms. Nilgün I will start by asking a question to all the participants can you please write on the chat box what comes to your mind when you hear the word human rights? And feel free to share your questions through the chat box as well, or at the end of the lecture, you can also raise your hand to ask questions. Welcome once again, and with that, I will give the floor to Ms. Nilgün. Hello, uh, welcome. Uh, well, we will be talking about human rights. Is it in crisis or not? Uh, human rights abuses used to be associated with uh, underdeveloped developing countries uh, and countries uh, where authoritarian or totalitarian uh, regimes prevail. Uh, unfortunately, nowadays we observe them almost everywhere, even the, in the most developed countries governed by most democratic regimes. Uh, today, we have the privilege to discuss uh, this important, very important issue with Professor Samuel Moyne. Uh, uh, he's a professor of law and history at Yale University. He has written several books in the fields of European intellectual history and human rights history. Uh, some of them uh, are The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History and Not Enough, human rights in an unequal world. We will talk about how human rights are not enough. Uh, the place of human rights law in an order where neoliberal policies are widespread and transformation and the future of uh, human rights movements. If I may, Professor Moyne, I'll uh, try to pose you three questions uh, from your publications uh, to initiate the discussion. You argue that the human rights movement after the 1970s have lost touch with uh, material egalitarianism, egalitarianism, failed to register the enormous material inequalities, and didn't th think to challenge the neoliberal truth that riches doesn't cause misery, that why human rights are important but not enough, necessary but not sufficient. In that sense, how do you describe the human rights movement today? Is the human rights movement in crisis? Also, you mentioned on a global scale, social rights turn into an anti-poverty project. Then with the rise of neoliberalism, social rights merge with the humanitarian charity logic. Not even poverty alleviation was about rights or justice anymore rights, development, and humanitarianism became interchangeable, and none was about distribution, distributive justice. So how do social rights differ from human rights? Can you explain it a little bit more? So my last question uh, is this. In your article titled, How the Human Rights Movement Failed, you told that the truth is that the growth of international human rights politics has accompanied the very economic phenomena that have led to the rise of radical populism and nationalism today. In short, human rights activism mode itself at home in a plutocratic world. Uh, may, I, I'm so sorry, in short, human rights activism made itself at home in a plutocratic world. Do you still think that 
way or is there any hope for the future? How, we, how can you comment on the recent human rights movement, especially during this global health crisis? And generally in retrospect, what did the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights accomplish? The floor is yours, Professor Moy. Thank you so much. Uh, I, first of all, I, I'm, I'm so uh, privileged to be invited to speak. Um, I want to say right at the start that I have no expertise uh, uh, in thinking about uh, your, your region of the world. Mm -hmm. Although I'll mention that one of the books that, was, that I wrote a, a, a while ago now called The Last Utopia has been translated into Turkish. Um, I really want to answer those three fantastic questions that I've just been posed. But what I propose to do is to address uh, uh, my new book, um, okay. just because if I give an overview of what I've tried to argue, I can I can face your questions with with the sure. whole framework. Um, does that make sense uh, to sure. use sure, to kind of give a lecture and answer your questions along the way? That will be great, please. Okay, so uh, I'm just sharing my screen so that you can uh, see what, what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's traditional for me to begin these lectures with a, a story uh, about uh, a, a woman named Jdena Tominova, who was an activist who gave an interesting speech uh, now 40 years ago, uh, it was the moment when human rights, as we'll see, were becoming world famous as a cause. And when civil society was becoming a phrase that got connected to human rights movements in different places. This woman, Jdena Tominova, was, was a Czech, Czechoslovak at that time. Mm. And she was the spokesperson for one of the first self-styled human rights groups in world history called Charter 77. Uh, and uh, because she was threatening to the Czech government, uh, the Czechoslovak government, she was first uh, uh, hurt by the secret police of her country. She had her head banged into the pavement just for being a spokesperson. Uh, and then she was invited to leave Czechoslovakia uh, for a, a, a while. And actually, she wasn't allowed to come back. So she gave a speech for Western uh, uh, activists uh, in 1980. And yet she surprised them because she said that uh, the idea of socialism under state socialism in Eastern Europe was an alibi for disregarding human rights and violating them. Uh, and that's what they expected to hear. But then she added something else, which is that she loved socialism. As a child, it had come to her country and uh, class privileges of the wealthy were lost and everyone got the same privileges. And she said, now what matters is that even when we stop treating socialism as an alibi for disregarding rights, we also have to avoid treating rights as an alibi for disregarding equality and socialism. She thought these two ideals went together the human rights announced in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 and, and distributive equality, at least to some extent. Now, her vision at that time did not come true. Uh, Google allows us to track how much people talk about things in some languages. I think we should complain to Google because they don't allow us to track Turkish or Armenian, uh, but they do allow us to see in all languages this astounding phenomenon that for most of the 20th century, people talked about socialism far more than they did human rights. You can see the red line is just way above 
uh, the blue line. But then something happened right before this Czech dissident civil society activist spoke. Socialism began to decline. And at the same time, human rights began to ascend. Around 1989, at the end of the Cold War, the lines crossed and human rights in our time began to take its place. So what I wanna ask in this lecture and answer the, the really important questions I was posed about whether human rights are in crisis, where social rights fit in human rights and what to say about populism and the health crisis we're living with is to look historically. I'm a historian and I'm interested in figuring out how in the past the idea of human rights, both before and after it became so popular in our time, connect to distributional ideals like distributional equality. And to simplify in the time I have, uh, I'm going to distinguish three stages in history. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll get to the present by the end, I promise, and, and definitely uh, address the burning questions that I know if you're not interested in history, you legitimately have about human rights. Uh, to make these stages you know, clear, I, I wanna pause before I launch and, and, and mention another distinction that is, is really pivotal, really uh, uh, all important in my, my argument, which is a distinction that moral philosophers have drawn between the ideal of sufficient provision and the ideal of equal distribution. The idea of sufficient provision says that there's some threshold uh, in the distribution of the basic decencies in life, uh, housing, health, uh, including in a pandemic, food, water, sanitation. Uh, and what matters is that we bring every citizen or human to that threshold. That's what morality requires and in fact, there are some philosophers today who call themselves sufficientarians, which means they say that's all that matters morally. The first one of these was a famous uh, Englishman who caused the American Revolution, actually, named Thomas Paine, who said, it doesn't matter how rich the rich are if the poor are brought out of poverty. Now, the human rights theorist, who thinks that social rights matter will say, it's not about money. There's a list of basic decencies to which each citizen or human has a right. And sufficient provision is best captured by um, giving everyone the basic decencies, health, housing, food, water, sanitation, to which they have a right. Uh, but that's just one form of sufficient provision. Others argue that we should monetize and give everyone a universal basic income. The point is that this moral ideal is about setting a minimum and saying we're obligated to meet it for everyone. Now, that's not the only moral view out there. Um, uh, the other one that I want to contrast to sufficient provision is distributional equality. In this view, what matters is how much we have in relation to other people, uh, and in particular, in relation to the rich. Uh, it matters how rich the rich are. We don't want a society, even if people have the bare minimum, or even a generous minimum, in which there's a massive hierarchy of income or wealth. Uh, and so what matters is not just what we could call a floor of protection, but also a ceiling on distribution. And you should just get clear that the idea of sufficient provision is not necessarily egalitarian. Uh, and indeed, as I'll try to argue in our time, sufficient provision is, is winning 
but in an increasingly unequal world in many places. So let me start with these three stages that I mentioned and run through them quickly because I really want to get to the, the original questions that should orient our discussion. First, let's start with the 19th century. Uh, of course, in, in that period, your part of the world was under uh, the Ottoman Empire and there were um, lots of big empires. Um, but world history was transformed by what, what we call the rise of capitalism. Uh, which, which had a huge impact and brought rights um, to the fore in new ways in the 19th century. Uh, they made them more connected to individuals rather than groups, like in a millet system of kind of group coexistence. Um, and they, um, historians show, were focused um, not on the rights we associate with human rights like free speech, but instead with the rights of the wealthy and especially the right to have free contract without interference from the state and property immune from state intervention and regulation. If we look what um, constitutions protected and what, is, what the rest of law protected, um, when judicially enforced, uh, most rights turn out to be the rights of the well-off in the 19th century. In fact, this went so far that uh, in his youth, Karl Marx uh, could write an essay saying that we should abandon human rights because they're always a smokescreen for the interests of the well-off. And it was no accident he, that he could say that because it was really true in the 19th century. And as a result, uh, you had the, the growth of poverty in the 19th century in many places and expanding inequality. The gulf between the rich and the rest, um, both in certain countries and around the world became greater than it had ever been in world history. Um, now I'll go to the second stage very quickly. It's the stage of nationalism and the stage of national welfare states, which conquer the world uh, uh, and become incredibly appealing to a lot of people. And the basic point I wanna make is that these welfare states often just as a matter of aspiration, uh, but often in practice too, um, tried to fight back against the 19th century. Uh, and they did so by declaring in constitutions new rights, including economic and social rights to basic decencies. Uh, that included the things like the right to work, but also rights to um, to welfare entitlements like housing, uh, food, and so forth. This happened first in, in Latin America, actually, and in the Mexican Constitution of 1917, but then across Europe, because there were a lot of new states after World War I and then World War II, uh, and globally as, as we track uh, constitutions. Um, and, and, and what I want to note th is that this was this welfare state was committed to both of the ideals that I mentioned at the start. It didn't choose one and abandon the other. Uh, the welfare state cared about sufficient provision, but also is the time um, compared to before or since when there was most concern about inequality at the national level. Now, these welfare states were always very problematic. As I mentioned, they were bound up everywhere with the victory of nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you know a lot about nationalism. Uh, and moreover, they were patriarchal. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, I think if we look at welfare states, we see two important events for rights that uh, contrast with the 19th century. On the one hand, people remain very skeptical 
uh, because of the experience of the 19th century that rights ought to be the main language of reformers. The main entities in civil society are trade unions in the welfare state, not human rights movements. Mm -hmm. And there are socialist parties, especially across the Atlantic and elsewhere. We know of the great correlation in the post-colonial world uh, between nationalism and socialism. But there's this other event for rights, which is very important that in ways that Marx could not imagine, rights had new items on the list, not just free contract and private property, but also economic and social rights. Uh, and that shows that the welfare state had a politics of rights. And we know that because of all the new constitutions that begin to feature social rights. On this basis, um, I'll just mention that the most famous thinker about social rights in the 1940s, this Englishman named T.H. Marshall, um, believed that, that a sufficient provision and equal distribution went together. He's the one who uses the, the architectural metaphor I used before. He says, if you build a floor for every fellow citizen, you're automatically building a ceiling too. And you can see why he might think that. Who else would pay? for helping the poor but the rich. And if there's more sufficient provision, he thought, then automatically there will be more equal distribution. As we'll see, he was wrong. But you can understand why in this moment, when there was more equality across many um, uh, states, uh, he believed that sufficient provision and equal distribution went together automatically, that social rights made us more equal. Now, I think this was the dominant view at the time of the Universal Declaration, uh, which didn't immediately give rise to the kinds of human rights movements we know, rather it reflected a politics of national welfare states across the world, including in the post-colonial world and post-imperial world, like in, in your part of the world. Uh, uh, in, in my book, I try to show that um, most post-colonial states um, were most concerned for a long time uh, about equality and indeed about global equality, because uh, a centuries of empire had created a very unequal world. Um, they wanted to oppose not just inequality within nations, but among states. Uh, and indeed, decolonization for the years of 1945 through 75 made global inequality worse. And so the global South, as we now call it, was most oriented not to sufficient provision at home or on the global stage, but to equal distribution. Uh, uh, but uh, they lost in their campaign, most famously when they announced in the mid 1970s, the new international economic order proposals. What I wanna talk about if in the last few minutes before thinking about uh, these hard questions I was posed at the start, is our time. What happened instead uh, of the global South idea, which was what we now call neoliberalism, and how human rights fit in our kind of political economy in our time. This is a big discussion, and there are a lot of different positions. I'm just going to give you mine, and if you're interested, I can direct you to uh, some who have reached other conclusions. Um, what, what's clear is that we can't afford to ignore the question of how human rights, the kind of idea and activism that we embrace relate to this new neoliberal political economy uh, across the world in the last 40 or 50 years. So I wanna make a few comments about uh, at the start about um, how distinctive human rights law and movements are 
in this neoliberal period. So first, to me, it's very important that human rights were never won back for the 19th century project of um, the, the interests of the wealthy. Uh, civil society groups like those some of you are part of are not neoliberal. They're pursuing human rights, including sometimes economic and social rights, not freedom of contract, but freedom of speech, freedom from false imprisonment, and sometimes welfare entitlements. So it's very important that if we ask anyone around the world what human rights are, they can't give Marx's answer anymore because human rights movements have changed our understanding of what entitlements matter most locally and nationally. That doesn't mean there aren't powerful neoliberal forces protecting contract, protecting property, but human rights movements are not. Second, human rights movements have done a lot to address what we can call status equality. As we know, most people are treated unfairly because of the kinds of people they are. Women, uh, if they're the wrong race in the view of the majority, if they're Kurdish, if they're uh, disabled. Uh, and human rights movements have placed at the very center of their activism, what we can call status equality. Uh, they care that people are treated equally and given their most basic rights, irrespective of the kind of group they're from. And this is of, of great importance because that wasn't true, not only in the 19th century, but in the welfare state, which often because of nationalism involved a lot of racialization and gendering. Um, third, human rights movements over time have embraced um, sufficient provision in the form of economic and social rights promotion. That wasn't true when human rights became famous in the 1970s, uh, when the second half of the Universal Declaration with economic and social rights was forgotten. For a long time, the most famous human rights activism was focused on free speech, false imprisonment, torture, uh, the death penalty, but not on economic and social rights. But that has tended to change since 1989, especially. And so we can say that human rights movements in a neoliberal age are concerned with, um, with sufficient provision. And yet, it seems essential that the age of human rights in all these amazing uh, uh, ways is also the age of the victory of the rich in many places. And most human rights movements have nothing to say about distributional inequality. They foreground status, but leave out distribution, except for sufficient provision. So how did it happen? What does it mean that human rights movements have embraced one of the two ideals with which I started, if they embrace any distributional ideals, they embrace sufficient provision, but not material uh, equality as a goal. Well, what I wanna say is, um, this is a hard question to explain. Um, I'll just say that it's turned out that Marshall was wrong, that we can imagine now because it's the world we're often living in, pursuing a floor of protection for the worst off, facing poverty and demanding more for those in misery, even while the rich get richer. Marshall didn't think that was possible, but our world proves it's, it's, it happens all the time and in many places. I'd not approve this case, I'd have to kind of look across the world and across a long period of time. Neoliberalism began in the 1970s, first in Chile, and then in my country in the United Kingdom, and went global, not just via national projects, but via in international financial institutions like the World Bank. And we'd have to look very carefully to see across this long period of time what happened. But 
my, my main point is that it turns out that human rights can be, let's say, hostage to neoliberal outcomes because uh, human rights are compatible with neoliberal outcomes. It turns out that you can build a floor of protection, which human rights advocates sometimes work on if they care about distribution at all, even while the ceiling on inequality is blown away. The most obvious examples of this are in the developing world, actually. Uh, in China, hundreds of millions of human beings have been saved from uh, 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 extreme uh, poverty, as the World Bank defines it, which is about a dollar and 50 a day. Uh, but at the same time, across the same three decades, China became more unequal, faster than any place has ever done in world history. We often think that a place like the United States, which has uh, embraced inequality massively in the same period, are the most unequal, but that's not true. Actually, China is far more unequal, even though it's brought the floor of poverty, or at least extreme poverty, up for millions. Uh, I haven't you know, done enough research on what we would say about Turkey. It's only fair to note that across the last uh, five decades, inequality in Turkey has gone down to some extent, although researchers show that in the Erdogan era, inequality is actually now on the rise in the past 15 years or so. But uh, Turkey remains one of the most unequal countries in the OECD. It has inequality on par with my country. Uh, and so we can ask, how is it that inequality died as a concern in our time, even as human rights survived? That's my basic question. And I wanna ask, should we be concerned about that result? Well, let me conclude by uh, saying that uh, I draw two lessons and it really allows me to face the questions I was posed at the beginning. I would never argue that we should abandon human rights, whether civil liberties like free speech uh, or economic and social rights, because of course, sufficient provision matters. Uh, it's, it, it, it is critical to have some groups focused on the, our basic rights, uh, including a long list of them. And of course, that's even more pertinent, as uh, I was asked at the beginning, uh, as uh, populism increases. And if, I don't want to make any comments about other countries than mine, but I think you know what I mean that human rights are critical in places where they're threatened by uh, regimes that, uh, that, that uh, trample our most basic entitlements. At the same time, equality matters too, uh, as that Czech dissident with whom I began insisted. First of all, it matters morally that we not take the importance of one set of ideals, human rights, as an excuse for abandoning another set of ideals. If sufficient provision matters, like the rest of human rights, then equal distribution should not be left behind uh, as if a one commitment required the abandonment of the other. But now I want to face, uh, you know, some of the questions I was asked. You know, I think human rights are always in crisis. They were in crisis in the 19th century uh, when they were a sham for the interests of the well-off. They were in crisis in the welfare state when they may have allowed more sufficient provision and less inequality, 
but on unacceptable terms, nationalist terms that involve the exclusion of a lot of our fellow citizens uh, in my country because they were black, maybe in yours because they were Armenian or Kurdish. Uh, they were in crisis in that era too because of the centrality of patriarchy in welfare states and especially in nationalism around the world. Uh, because this was an era of strong men. Uh, and uh, we, we should ask about the relationship between nationalist strong men who may have founded our countries, uh, as in your case, uh, and the exclusion of women from rights to this day. But human rights are also in crisis now when they're uh, in a neoliberal cage. And I, th I don't think they have to remain in this cage that a human rights can join with egalitarian ideals, uh, just as that Czech dissident I began with um, foresaw. Last, I'll say that this argument may be connected to what we say about populism and its appeal, at least in some places. We can't homogenize all the different cases across the world uh, as if there's one explanation for populism, no matter where it is. But I do want to suggest that in some places, the uh, crisis of inequality is part of the reason why populism can succeed. Uh, and it leads uh, leaders who volunteer to scapegoat our fellow citizens with a lot of support. Uh, if we expanded our moral ideals and made sure not to choose human rights instead of egalitarian distribution, we might have more success in opposing uh, populist forces. I can only cite the example of my country since I'm not an expert at all in yours that the, the Democratic Party in my country returned to power by taking Donald Trump seriously and saying that he spoke uh, on behalf of people who had been given a raw deal in the neoliberal era. And so my suggestion is that we think that human rights depend on a large set of conditions that human rights activists can't provide because human rights activists focus selectively. In my terms, they're focusing selectively on civil liberty or at most sufficient provision instead of distributional equality. Whether they focus on distributional equality or we need other movements to do so, I, I leave open. I'm not sure how to think about that question. But I conclude by saying that uh, we should think of human rights as imprisoned in a neoliberal political economy and we should all care about finding the key that can open the door to this prison and lead us uh, to the exit. So I'll stop there, uh, having reached 40 minutes, and I'll be glad to entertain questions. I think I answered all of yours along the way, but I'm <laughs> glad to be clearer if I failed. Uh, thanks a lot for this enlightening speech and answering all of our questions. You took us through the uh, through the history. Uh, you showed us the evolution of the human rights, and uh, you showed us the discrepancy, like between uh, inequality and human rights. Uh, I've never thought about it, but you made it very clear. Uh, there are questions coming from the audience, but first, uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to how. Uh, Sorry, I just uh, to Hakan Bey is the moderator in the other session. Hakan Ataman. So before, uh -huh. hello, can you hear me? 
So I have a question to, to Mr. Samuel Almoin. Well, indeed, in his lecture, he extensively talked about this and he put forward his ideas on this. But in his last book, Human Rights in an Unequal World, well, before that, he had an article on New York Times and he said, why the human rights activists failed. That was the name of the article. And he talked about economic and social rights. And he said that there isn't enough research or there aren't enough studies in this field. He said mm -hmm. the reason for this failure was this. And what I understand from his speech today here is that the human rights movement is not on a very uh, successful course. Is that the case? Or the reason of the failure is that it didn't focus enough on the social and economic rights. And in the coming stage, uh, with more studies or research in this field, would that bring any success to the human rights movement? Would that be enough? Or what, what do you think? What do you think has to be there so that there will be an efficient rights activism and human rights movement? Thank you. It's, it's a wonderful question, thank you. Uh, so a first note that in, in, in my country, when you write an article for the newspaper, you do not get to write the headline. Uh, so so uh, you have to read the article as you did, and I appreciate it uh, to get at my argument. Um, you know, it's been argued many times before, um, that the trouble with some versions of the human rights movement it, it, uh, is that they neglected economic and social rights. Uh, in fact, that's an incredibly familiar claim in many places. It's still true. Um, it's true in some countries, especially in mine, where we have very prestigious organizations like Human Rights Watch, um, which are the best funded human rights organizations in the world, they neglect economic and social rights. So I agree with that argument. It's not mine, um, but I agree with it. My argument, which I hope is more original, is that even economic and social rights are not enough. Uh, and, and that's for the reasons I tried to explain in the lecture, that if we care just about uh, sufficient provision, uh, we, we don't look at uh, whether we're, we are in an inequality crisis. Now, I leave open what human rights movement should do. I think I haven't done enough research to say, um, you know, whether in Turkey there should be more attention to economic and social rights by activists. I suspect there should, but my argument is very different, which is that it's not so much human rights activists as all of us who have selected out um, human rights almost as an exclusive concern and forgotten that equality matters too, not just what I called status equality, but distributional equality. I actually am skeptical that existing human rights groups can just take on board more um, to do just because they have so little success in pursuing human rights. Why would we expect them to do the job of trade unions and socialist parties, which are almost gone across the world. But we should demand new forms of civil society and, and engage in them and have human rights groups alongside these new egalitarian movements. Now, in fairness, in response to my work, some in human rights have argued that human rights organizations as they exist are the right organizations to become egalitarian, to take on board an even more ambitious agenda than economic and social rights. I doubt it uh, because they're not all that 
uh, successful at protecting human rights and they could put at risk what they know how to do in broadening their agenda. But if it's true that human rights depend in the long run on, uh, on addressing this crisis of inequality, then human rights activists should really care about that crisis and hope that some people emerge to face it, even if it's not human rights movements themselves. Uh, now I will give the floor to Nilay Kavur. She also wrote her questions maybe, but she'd like to pose the questions herself. But before giving the floor, there's an uh, Armenian, uh, there's a question by Valia Martirosyan asked in Armenian. While we are hearing uh, Aileen uh, Kavur, can you please translate that question? for me to pose to uh, Professor Moy. So the floor is yours, uh, Aydin Kavur. Nilay Kavur, I'm so sorry, Nilay Kavur. It's, it, it's, it's a wonderful question. Thank you. So, so uh, sh she's referring, I think, brilliantly to one part of Karl Marx's original attack on human rights. And the, mm -hmm. the claim was that the reason why, in practice, human rights were really about freedom of contract and, and, and the protection of property was that human rights were individualist um, he used the word egoistic. Uh, and it's actually very popular to say that the trouble with human rights today uh, is that um, they are egoistic. They don't allow collective demands. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's no surprise that they're caught up in this neoliberal syndrome. So there are a lot of Marxist arguments to this effect. I think the most brilliant I've seen is from an Australian thinker named Jessica White, but I don't agree with that argument. Here's why. Marx was wrong. Uh, 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 freedom of speech, which he directly addressed, is about collectivity. It's about communicating with one another. Uh, and in our time, economic and social rights are often uh, collective demands like civil liberties uh, of large movements. Uh, and it, to vindicate those rights requires massive structural change. Uh, so I don't think it can be, you know, credibly said that the trouble with human rights is that they're individualist. I do think they have a limited moral horizon, even so, because the structural change that they demand, which is often happening in many places, is to help the poor without regard to how rich the rich become. Uh, and so my own argument is that we should focus less on the idea that human rights are too individualist uh, and acknowledge how much collective power we have mobilizing for our ideals but we shouldn't just accept the ideals of rights, but that of 
material equality alongside these individual rights. Uh, now, uh, the final question is from uh, Zeynep Meydanoğlu from uh, Ashoka. Uh, she asked to you, where do you see the new forms of civil society emerge? Or maybe you would like to ask it, uh, Zeynep, uh, yourself. But let me let me briefly ask you, where do you see the new forms of civil society emerge? Could you give us an example? Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Good. Good. I'm, uh, you know, this goes back to probably a, a, a question that I was asked at the beginning that I failed to answer. So I appreciate the opportunity, uh, which is, you know, whether I'm hopeful, I actually am very hopeful. Uh, and that's because I, I have seen in my lifetime, people think more broadly uh, in their movements than they once did. Um, I completely think that change happens because of movements, not because of theories. Uh, and in fact, theories uh, of the kind I'm offering just reflect, you know, what ordinary people are doing. And I'm just trying to interpret it for in an academic way. And as you say, there are promising signs. Um, first, that uh, you have instead of um, human rights activism alone, you have a lot of new kinds of movements that are transcending the boundaries of movements before. In my country, you're right to single out Black Lives Matter, which um, it refuses to make minimal demands. A good example is that it has adopted um, a, an, a, a, an attack on the reform of policing, um, and adopted abol an abolitionist attitude towards things like mass incarceration and police violence. But I would also point to the rise of um, uh, the, uh, the, the movement around healthcare as a right uh, in among American uh, progressives and Bernie Sanders' candidacy, which among young people has excited movements like didn't exist in my, when I was a young person in the 1990s. Uh, and so I think we're getting beyond the period in which human rights were the only idea uh, and that all reform had to be conceived in human rights terms. As you say, movements around the world are proving that there, there's, there are more options and we need them. Uh, uh, as as I hope my lecture suggested. Thank you for the question. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Moyne. We will be closing this a uh, more than excellent uh, session here. But uh, before closing, I'll have some announcements to make. Uh, if you have further questions, we would strong, strongly advise you to uh, come together in an activity next week, uh, in a uh, activity in another, let me say, workshop next week that will take place next Thursday on 25th of March. Uh, our colleagues will send you the registration information for this uh, workshop. And if you could kindly uh, answer the uh, questionnaire that my colleagues will uh, send you towards uh, through the chat, we will be very very pleased. Uh, and if you can share three things you uh, took away from this uh, panel, that will be very helpful for us. Also, finally, uh, the next panel of this series uh, will take place on next Wednesday on 24th of March. Uh, 
the main uh, the topic will be main approaches in civil society services and advocacy it will take place at uh, 6 p.m next wednesday thanks a lot to you first professor moin and to all the participants thank you thank you it's a privilege i think we are closing the session timely thank you